Well, it, this is a, uh, an amazing gathering, and it's, uh, I'm humbled by the number of people in this room who have been instrumental in working to move California to the place that it now is uh, poised, I think, at the potential beginning of an educational renaissance in education. And that's because of the extraordinary efforts of many of the organizations and individuals represented in this room who have been at this for a very long time. So I'm deeply honored to be uh, asked to start our thinking during this very important day. Uh, three major issues are critical to this potential turnaround, uh, and they are the three I think that uh, EdSource uh, has identified for our conversations today. Rectifying the state's badly broken school funding system, focusing the system on meaningful learning, goals that can prepare young people for 21st century demands, and developing a uniformly strong teaching and leadership workforce. And the other element, I think, that is critical to this educational renaissance that I believe is pending is the extraordinary leadership that we have at the state level that is committed to working collaboratively to bring us uh, to a much more thoughtful and coherent place in education policy. Uh, our governor has been extraordinary in uh, his work to uh, pass Proposition 30 uh, and in his commitment to a new funding system for the state. Our state board president, Mike Kirst, who is my own personal um, role model and mentor in this field, uh, brings us decades of experience and wisdom uh, to that incredibly important post uh, and works uh, collaboratively uh, with the governor and with the uh, governor's uh, uh, appointees, Karen Staff Walters is now in that role. Sue Burr was previously both extraordinary um, leaders and uh, public servants. So, State Superintendent Tom Torlakson, um, who has been busy putting out um, an agenda since his transition report and in the most recent work of the Excellence in Education Task Force. I'll hold up that report, Greatness by Design, which I think lays out many of the uh, issues around the teaching force that we are concerned about, um, the CTC, the California Teacher Credentialing Commission, uh, with its extraordinary executive director, Mary Sandy, who's here. I mention all these people because what's amazing to me, and I've been in California now for almost two decades, uh, and I feel like I'm really a Californian now because I do apologize for the weather when it is a little too hot or a little too cold or has a drop of rain, so I've, I've now made the transition. Um, is that in all the years I've been here, there's never been such an uh, amazingly expert team of individuals uh, with shared commitments willing to actually get their agencies working together. Uh, that is, uh, in and of itself, uh, an important and amazing uh, eventuality that we need, that we need to be um, grateful for and work with. And then, of course, there's so many organizations that have been from the teachers, from the administrators, from the parents, from the community-based organizations that have been putting their shoulder to the wheel. So I want to say a word about those three issues I identified, where I think we have been, where I think we are, and where I think we may be going, and what I think some of the issues and challenges are that we need to work on to help us get to the place where California is again uh, one of the leading states in the nation in education. California is, of course, a wholly unique state, but arguably one that represents the future of the United States. Uh, it is a state that some would say has been on the verge of educational collapse, but it is also a resilient state with enormous human and other resources available, and one that I think has the leadership um, if it is joined with public will. Uh, as you probably know, uh, we have in this state uh, a more diverse student population than virtually any other. More than a third of our students are English learners. Uh, that is the greatest share of any state. More than half of our students uh, live in poverty. Uh, we have uh, an enormous number of uh, immigrant uh, students who are both a resource and a part of our strength as a state if we educate properly 
uh, uh, and uh, who are um, at this moment in the state um, among the most segregated um, students. California is one of the three most segregated states for Latino students and one of the five most segregated states for African American students and high minority schools are among the most under-resourced in the state. So this is a critical issue that obviously needs to be on the agenda. Uh, this is an audience that knows well about the 20 years that followed Proposition 13 uh, when funding shrank, inequality in educational opportunities and outcomes grew. Uh, John Merrow did a film about California's slide entitled From First to Worst, uh, and I think many of us have seen um, how that was experienced. At the point where the Williams versus California school funding lawsuit was brought, uh, there were uh, many schools in the state that literally uh, served, um, generally speaking, African American and Latino students in apartheid segregated circumstances with uh, severe levels of under-resourcement, crumbling buildings, not enough textbooks for children to even have one every day in class, much less take one home, uh, a revolving door of inexperienced and uncredentialed teachers. At the worst of that period of time, we had 50,000 teachers in California teaching on emergency credentials, most of them concentrated in high minority, uh, low-income schools. Um, and we continue to struggle with uh, re building uh, a system that has uh, a base of opportunity. Uh, there was a settlement in Williams that moved us a little bit forward in providing some uh, floor on facilities and textbooks, um, but quite a bit more work to do. And we became one of the most unequally funded states in the country, having been one of the most equitably funded right after Serrano. So in the most recent data um, available, uh, the uh, top spending districts in the state, even if you ignore the top 5% at the 95th percentile, we're spending three times as much as the districts at the bottom. If you correct that for cost of living differentials, it's a four to one ratio, which means it's even harder to educate kids on the resources available in cities and uh, other communities that have high costs of living. Uh, and uh, a lot of that funding, an extraordinarily high proportion of the resources, has been coming from a large number of restricted categorical programs. Uh, and that uh, makes it very difficult to use the funds to meet the fundamental needs that you have to offer the basic elements of a high quality education. Uh, Mike Kirst has called this the hardening of the categoricals. Uh, and uh, having worked in a lot of low-income schools and districts, what I've seen uh, that many others have experienced is that you may have you know, enough money coming from one categorical to buy a half of a violin for your music program, but not to actually support a music program, or to support a third of a librarian, you know, but not enough to actually staff a library or whatever. And all these little tiny pots of money, which then have a lot of monitoring and reporting attached to them, which ties up the resources of people at school and district levels and at the state level. It turns the state into really a compliance monitoring machine and makes it hard to do the things that you might really need to do, like raise teacher salaries so that you're competitive in the labor market and can hire people who are qualified and keep them to teach the children, which is the most fundamental resource. So we have a lot uh, to uh, address, and in a moment I'll come back around to the uh, local control funding formula that is currently on the table in Sacramento. Uh, but I want to note as well that these inequalities have also then led to large inequalities in teacher salaries and working conditions across the state, which have produced staffing problems in high need districts. Um, statewide, salaries for comparably educated and experienced teachers varied by more than a ratio of two to one in 2009. That is, you could earn twice as much uh, in one district that was well-paying as in another. And when you control for cost of living differentials, it gets worse. Uh, so we have some California districts which is with as many as 50% of their teachers uncredentialed and as many as 60% of them inexperienced, while other districts have a stable supply of well-prepared uh, and um, experienced teachers. Uh, also, after nearly 20 years of dwindling resources and the proliferation 
uh, of various routes into the teaching, the quality of teacher education has become highly variable across the state. We have some of the nation's most excellent programs, uh, and we have programs that offer very little uh, real support for teachers coming into the classroom. We have the whole gamut, and we've had a, a continual shrinking of the program supports for professional learning. So we expect the most of our teachers, we expect them to know how to teach English learners, how to teach students with special needs, um, how to meet the needs of a diverse, uh, culturally and um, uh, uh, linguistically diverse student force, uh, meeting higher standards with the Common Core standards coming in, and we give them less training and support than virtually any other state in the nation. Professional development has shrunk. We started many of the most impressive programs in the nation. The Beginning Teacher Support and Assessment Program, BITSA, was a California invention. The Peer Assistance and Review Program, the only state in the nation to have that uh, legislation statewide. The California School Leadership Academy, which was emulated by at least 20 other states. The California Subject Matter Projects, which many other states have picked up and grown in their own locations, and almost all of those have been drastically reduced or almost eliminated, in some cases actually eliminated, as the budgets have been cut. So we have to rebuild an infrastructure for professional learning in this state. Um, and uh, we need to be able to tap the great strategies we have enacted in the past and build on them to do that. And then finally, in the area of standards, curriculum, and assessment, uh, in the face of decreasing funding, much legislative energy in California has gone to enacting mandates uh, because that's something that can stand or did until recently stand in lieu of funding until we had the requirement that unfunded mandates no longer be passed. So California schools are among the most highly regulated in the nation. Um, and this regulatory approach uh, extends into the area of curriculum and assessment. We've had a more prescriptive set of curriculum frameworks and instructional materials policies than most other states. Most other states do not, for example, have state approval of textbooks or materials. Uh, most, no other state has a, a system like A through G, which says you must take these specific courses and have them approved in order to go to college. Um, no state had a requirement like uh, California had on its science standards uh, that only 25% of the um, Instruction could be inquiry oriented, and that was increased from a high of 10% at a moment in time. Uh, you know, that it mostly had to be the teaching of uh, factual information rather than the uh, use of experimentation and investigation. Uh, so, we also have to rethink how are we going to bring that curriculum standards and, and testing system into the 21st century. We also have more tests than almost any other state in the nation for our students. In high school alone, kids have 21 tests before they get to the SAT, the ACT, um, the AP or anything else, uh, and 35 over the course of the years. And those tests are almost exclusively multiple choice. We have the lowest cost testing system in the nation, uh, with the exception of Oregon, right uh, to our north. Uh, there was recently a study by the RAND Corporation, which included California, uh, when it looked at the 17 states with the most rigorous standards and assessments to see how many of the items on the test measured higher order thinking skills. And those are skills of critique, evaluation, being able to explain and defend your ideas, to apply what you're learning to a new situation. And on this group of 17 states, uh, as a whole, in which California was one, fewer than 2% of items on the math tests measured higher order thinking skills. And only 20% on the English language arts tests. And that will be very significant as we move into the implementation of Common Core standards and new assessments, uh, which are going to put uh, significantly greater demands on children to be able to use what they know uh, in productive ways. So, a new set of strategies are emerging for building uh, a system of California education. I think that they, um, as, uh, as the State Board and the Governor and the State um, Department of Education and Credentialing Commission have been articulating them, uh, they aim in several directions. They aim to take account of the changing demands of a 21st century knowledge-based, technology-driven economy. 
They aim to acknowledge and respond to and build on and appreciate the diversity of California's students so that more students are enabled to be successful and the state benefits from the languages uh, that are here, from the cultural um, resources that are here. Uh, to create a more flexible and streamlined and integrated system of education uh, that supports as well as um, uh, creates education expectations, and then to position the state to become the hub of a learning system uh, rather than just a compliance machinery um, to enforce rules. Uh, in that regard, the uh, local control funding formula is an extraordinary proposal. Uh, it would increase the resources into the system, uh, which is a result of our Prop 30, um, oh, over the years, uh, the Prop 30 resources. Um, it would allocate those based on pupil need, based on uh, the number of students living in poverty or English learners. It would allow more local flexibility. Uh, and I think all of those things will dramatically transform the possibilities for education in this state. There, were, uh, there are some other states that we might look to for how such an initiative might play out. And I want to point for, for a moment to Massachusetts. What many people don't realize about Massachusetts' rise to the number one state in the nation on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, uh, it competes with the highest achieving countries in the world, uh, is that that rise was stimulated in the first place by a move to a weighted student formula, much like the one that's proposed here, uh, as the result of a school finance lawsuit back in the early 1990s, which was then accompanied by deep investments in preschool education statewide. It was accompanied by standards and assessments. Uh, and uh, in Massachusetts, those standards from that time did aim for higher order thinking skills uh, and the assessments have much more open-ended uh, expectations of students to write and to think whereas we spend about uh, $15 per pupil on our assessments, 16 in English and math, uh, they're spending $87 per pupil because they do all kinds of open-ended assessment um, and uh, teacher scoring. Uh, they put enormous investments into professional learning for teachers. Um, they uh, made what I think was a strategic, uh, two strategic errors in the years following. One was to uh, add high stakes uh, to the assessments uh, in a way that created more inequality in outcomes than they would otherwise have experienced. The other was that they backslid with a tax revolt and they lost a little bit of the ground that they had accomplished in the early 1990s. Uh, but that set of efforts propelled them to the top of the nation. They have preserved most of those efforts uh, and they have continued to build the system. Uh, New Jersey uh, more recently did something like that and over the course of 10 years shot up to one of the highest performing states in the nation, although they serve 46% students of color, more than a third in poverty by investing in high need uh, districts with much greater resources, preschool, uh, professional learning resources, and cut their achievement gap in half. So I think that as we uh, approach this, it's going to be, a, um, it is a controversial move. It's an enormous move to really change. I, I looked at the data recently uh, for a school that uh, is in a, one of the highest poverty communities um, near us that I work with. Uh, this is a school that serves 95% low income students, 85% English language learners. Its per pupil allocation from the state would double under the local control funding formula uh, while uh, the um, Allocations to other uh, schools will increase relative to um, the, their levels of need. That's really uh, hiri kiri territory for a governor um, to be you know, going on to. Uh, very courageous uh, and will transform the possibilities for all kinds of other things in this state. Uh, challenges, how do we ensure if that passes that the uh, unmandated funds, the decategorized funds, focus on the students for whom they were intended. Uh, what are the mechanisms that can be used other than 
rigid categorical programs? And second, how can we focus on being sure that there are resources in the system to build capacity of teachers and school leaders? Uh, because those used to be in categorical programs. And there are several ways to think about that. One is that this idea of local control over the allocation of resources is informed by the knowledge base of the people in the schools. So it has to become the business of the state to be sure that teachers and school leaders really are expert about what's likely to work, both in terms of classroom practices and in terms of uh, policies at the local level about the nature of the curriculum, the kinds of investments, uh, and so on. And, and that's going to be a job for the CDE, for the state board, for uh, the colleges of education, uh, for the CTC to take up. Because you can't have trust of the field, the principle of subsidiarity. Uh, you can't have that working unless you have deep investments and in expertise so that you can believe that and know that people will be able to make good decisions about what they're doing. And that's the way that Finland operates. Um, lots of autonomy, but intensive training on the front end uh, and a lot of evaluation, always evaluating everything to see what's working, what's not working, and feeding that back into the whole system with networking across the schools um, and municipalities to help them know. And the other thing is to have standards about what uh, a few standards, well chosen, about what we expect should be going on in certain areas, like the in training and induction of beginning teachers and so on. That takes me to the second area, the educator quality area. There are a lot of initiatives underway right now uh, to leverage higher professional standards. Uh, I'll talk about the CTC agenda for just a second. Uh, we've just adopted new English learner standards for uh, embedding in the preparation of teachers through both traditional and um, alternative routes. We've uh, adopted uh, regulations for embedding the common core state standards into preparation programs. We're moving towards an approach that really values outcomes uh, as evaluated through performance assessments of both teachers and school administrators that allow us to know if people really can do the things that we hope they will be able to know and do in order to teach all of our students well and to lead schools effectively. Uh, we look to rethinking how BITSA and PAR and other programs come together uh, to support induction for both beginning teachers and leaders, and we will need to figure out how to uh, leverage practices in the field through standards and accreditation that enable those good practices to occur uh, outside the context of a more intensely regulated categorical program. Uh, in the state, we've got a lot of good conversation going on now about the way in which educator evaluation systems may unfold. And we had uh, in the Greatness by Design Task Force uh, all of the stakeholders at the table uh, who articulated a really thoughtful approach to expand and clarify the work that goes on under the Stull Act to ensure that we evaluate with quality standards the practices of teachers, their con contributions um, to the uh, school as a whole and to their colleagues because actually collaboration is a better predictor of student achievement gains at the school level than the work of any individual teacher. So we need an evaluation system that emphasizes collegiality and collaboration, doesn't pit teachers against each other or rank and sort them against each other. Uh, that takes into account student learning evidence in thoughtful ways, including multiple sources of evidence that are appropriate to the kids and the curriculum being taught, um, not just state test scores, which are limited in what they can evaluate. Uh, and that does that in a blended way, where none of these things are weighted uh, more than another, but where we look at, in, a, in an integrated way, uh, all of the elements. And then we need to build a professional development infrastructure. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, and we call for a professional development master plan. There's one thing that I think is a house on fire in California, in this area. And if we were going to do anything quickly uh, in this next year or two, it is that we need to fix uh, the investments in teachers who teach students with disabilities. Uh, special education in this state is completely broken with respect to the 
credentialing system. And I, those of you working in the field know this, the credentialing system and the funding system. We have a lot of people now who don't have a base credential in teaching before they get a nine month internship route into special education. The knowledge base is vast. It's huge. What ends up happening is schools can't actually put regular ed and special ed kids together um, in classes, and therefore they can't do um, the kinds of interventions that are being called for, uh, RTI and other things. So we have to fix that. And if I were going to uh, ask the governor for one thing in this term, I would say, let's put $50 million into ensuring that the teachers who've been laid off uh, from schools lately uh, get support to add a credential in a shortage area, and that would include special education, math, physical science, uh, and uh, teaching of English learners. Uh, to add that at the state's expense in high quality programs, make investments in that initiative, get hundreds of teachers out there quickly who have the knowledge base so that districts can begin to do the work that they know they want to do on behalf of the kids who are struggling the most and who we need to be able to support to meet these new high standards. And I'll very quickly talk about the curriculum and assessment piece. Uh, we now have Common Core Standards having been adopted in English Language Arts and Math. Science will be coming soon. Uh, a new bill just was voted out of committee this week, AB 484, uh, which calls for radical changes in the way we do assessment in the state. Uh, the adoption of the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium assessments, the elimination of CSTs that are not required by No Child Left Behind to give us room to implement the Common Core State Standards, and then the consideration and deliberation about how to bring on board new assessments in those non-English language arts and math areas, including portfolios and performance tasks uh, by 2015. Uh, being able to think about what would 21st century standards really require for children to be able to problem solve, think critically, write, communicate orally, um, engage with each other in uh, the kind of complex problem solving that we need. I think this uh, signals real improvements in the signals to schools about what should be taught and how it should be taught. We know that tests are going to affect the nature of teaching. We need tests worth teaching to. Uh, the smarter balanced assessments are significantly more complex. I gave you a state statistic earlier about higher order skills. Uh, in the content specifications for smarter balanced, over 60% of the assessment targets call for measures of that are higher order skills uh, as compared to the minimal proportion now, which means kids will be asked to analyze and evaluate and synthesize information. Uh, a, a performance task that you can find on their website uh, that is an example would require kids to take an issue. You're a congressperson, uh, you want a, a, a nuclear power plant is coming into your state. Uh, the student is the congressional intern who is asked to go research this nuclear power thing and come back with a memo. And they go online and Google and find a set of sites. Actually, there's a prepared uh, space within which they can't uh, go off too far into the places we don't want them to go online. Uh, and uh, they figure out what the pros and cons are for nuclear power. They have to answer a set of questions about what those are, what the credibility of the different sources is. And then the congressperson, when they've handed that in, comes back to them and says, I don't have time to read your memo. The vote is today. Write me a speech, uh, a little essay telling me what to do with all the alternatives. And then they have to write and revise that piece of work based on their research. Uh, this is a very different kind of learning, teaching, and assessment than what we have been experiencing. Uh, it puts before us new possibilities. Uh, if we can bring that kind of work also into the sciences, into the social studies, into the arts and humanities, uh, we will be preparing our kids for the California that we want for the future. Uh, but the big question for us will be how do we recreate our accountability system as supportive and informational 
and not punitive for children, for teachers and school leaders, and for schools. At the end of the day, uh, California is poised for this kind of transformation with the work of all of the people in this room and many others. But we need to recognize that this is going to be a long-term effort, like the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Europe after World War II. To rebuild the education system, uh, we should think of this challenge and opportunity in terms of decades, not a few months or a few years. Our commitment and our strategic investment needs to be built and sustained over time and beyond single budget election and policy cycles. While the effort will be substantial, our goal should be nothing less than a golden state that represents, as it once did, the best place on earth for educators to work and students to learn, a state that cultivates the human ingenuity and intelligence that will fuel our economy, create a sustainable, healthy environment, and ensure that all residents are able to make contributions that reflect their unique passions and their highest potential. Let's get busy. Thank you.